So if you missed part of this or you're joining us late, several people told me they're planning to join, you know, maybe an hour or two into be, uh, the lecture tonight because normally on a, a Wednesday they don't uh, have art 2.1. So that's no problem. That's always going to be your option, whatever you want. If one night you miss the section that you're assigned to and you want to just go into the other one, you will need to let me know by email at least 24 hours ahead. But an easier option is to see the... Uh, lectures or portions of a lecture you miss on um, the uh, YouTube video a connection and it's under Mark Wilson's SRJC Art History Lectures R2.1 and then whatever week you want and then you can go right to them. Okay, um, I'm going to do something with a larger screen here now. Let's see, I hope I get this to do that because I want to show you something before we get started with today's uh, lecture here. <laughs> well, it doesn't want to do, oh yeah, there we go, speaker view. All right, there we go. I, I created something and it is definitely low tech. <laughs> Some things, obviously, I've mastered and some I haven't. And this has nothing to do with my ability to, to function on Zoom. That's not the issue here. It's that I did not have time to take that large whiteboard, which is quite heavy, and move all my furniture around, take it down, write this stuff on that, you know, erase the other things that we saw. Remember the second week with the nine elements of composition? If you missed that lecture, you definitely want to catch that one on the Zoom, uh, I mean, on uh, YouTube. Uh, the recording of it. Uh, anyway, the point is that, that would have taken a lot more time than I had uh, to prepare today. So here we go. This is going to seem very low tech, but I think it'll work for most of you. What I've done is write down the names of some of the main players tonight. So I figure at least a couple of you may, you know, one or two of you may actually want to, I'm trying to hold it as straight as I can, take a screenshot of it or just make a mental note. Why am I showing you these? Because these are not on the syllabus. These particular uh, historical uh, or mythical figures from ancient Egyptian uh, history are going to come up in the lecture, and I'm not going to be able to spell them for you or we'll never get through tonight's uh, topic. So as usual, you don't have to worry about the spelling of any words that are not on the syllabus when it comes to the exams, uh, the midterm uh, and final. <clears throat> but I, I thought you'd like to, some of you have the spellings. Uh, so Amenhotep is the original name of the pharaoh who uh, was married to Nefertiti. And of course, we're going to see the bust of Nefertiti tonight. He changed his name to Akhenaten and changed the religion. We'll talk all about this. You don't take notes yet uh, when we get to those slides. Uh, he changed the entire Egyptian religious um, pantheon from multiple gods to a single god. And he called it a ten or Ra is the other name. Those two names mean the same thing, the sun god. And we'll say what happened when people were told they had to give up their old gods by their pharaoh and his wife. Uh, not all of them were pleased. Uh, something happened because of that. We'll talk about that later. And then T, T-I-Y, it was Tut's grandmother and uh, Ankenaten or Amenhotep, remember that's the same person, uh, his mother. She was a very powerful woman, and we'll talk about her briefly, though she's not, there's no slides of her on the syllabus. And lastly, we'll finish with my own slides of uh, the, uh, temp well, it's called the Valley of the Kings in Luxor, which is a city that's very much a modern, well, not now a tourist site, but before the pandemic, and will be again, major tourist site in Egypt. 400 miles south of Cairo, we'll see Cairo, we'll see the Great Pyramids up close, then we'll take a trip down the Nile, with the slides that I took on this trip and go inside King Tut's tomb and uh, a couple of other tombs. And those are in the Valley of the Kings uh, and uh, Karnak Temple is also in Luxor. Okay, so I don't know if any of you wanted to, I'll hold this for about another 30 seconds if you didn't yet want to grab a camera. I mean, if you have one handy and you want to take a screenshot, okay? And then we'll start tonight's lecture with the first slide from the syllabus that you, of course, will need to take notes of. Okay, enough on that. All right, uh, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of uh, background. There's two more people want to join the waiting room from the waiting room, so hang on. Let's just take 30 seconds. Okay, good. 
So if you're just joining us, we haven't yet started the uh, main part of the lecture, but you might want to uh, put an extra note or two above your slide notes for the first must know slide we're gonna to get to in just about a minute or two, because I like to give context that you don't have to write the context background information. That's optional, but, but it helps with the meaning of any of these slides that might appear on the uh, midterm. And I can tell you for sure, at least one of these slides will be on the essay part of the uh, midterm and probably one other will be on just the identification part. So you, I'll tell you when the most important slides, I've done that every week now. I'll say this slide is so important, I'm not cutting it from the study list, that's your cue to take extra careful, thorough notes. And um, also, oh, um, thank you, uh, Marie. That's the kind of thing that yeah, I wouldn't be able to do unless my daughter showed me. She swears she's gonna show me how to make slides out of the things I held up just now and that kind of thing, but I didn't have time today. Thank you. Appreciate that. I'm sure your fellow students uh, will benefit from that. Okay, so ancient Egypt, let's start with the fact that it's, there are five civilizations. I think this is important detail. Um, oh yeah, it's been spelled both ways. In Stockstead, it's T-I-Y, and I've seen it spelled T-Y. So you guys could spell it either way, but she's not on the syllabus. So either spelling is acceptable. You know the word Koran can be spelled about eight different ways. So, you know, we have to pick one and go with that. But that's not one that's on the, um, oh, someone else wants to be admitted. Let's do that before we get started with the actual picture. One less. Okay. So what I was trying to convey is the amazing quality of ancient Egyptian culture in comparison with other, quote, urban civilizations. That's just a generic phrase for those societies that developed, you know, cities and specialized or differentiated labor, some people call it, you know, where there was not just, you know, everyone got, went out hunting, but we start to have, you know, farmers and carpenters and bricklayers and skilled workers and, and uh, laborers and so forth and, and living in, in communities, cities. So there were five, this is the main point I wanna make and we'll get right to the first slide in like two minutes. In the history of the entire planet, the five oldest urban civilizations in the world are ancient Egypt, Last week's topic was the Near East or Mesopotamia. Some people could say Babylon because it, it was the main uh, dominant culture. We covered last week. Okay, so the ancient Near East, China, India, and I don't know if any of you know the fifth one. Uh, it's in Art uh, 1.2. We cover that. Uh, in this class, we just touch on it briefly because it's not part of, quote, Western art, though it ought to be. And that's Mesoamerica, or in other words, the pre-Columbian is the old phrase, cultures that existed before the arrival of the European colonists. And of course, those cultures go back almost as far as ancient um, Egypt. But Egypt was the first. Egypt is the oldest continuously uh, developed, you know, urban civilization on earth that has not, you know, ever been abandoned. <laughs> Obviously there are changes have occurred in that part of the world. We'll talk about some of those later in, in uh, later lectures. Okay, so Egypt is, some would call it the mother of all civilization. I don't think that's an overstatement. And having over 5,200 years of history that uh, are, you know, or each era they had was of some importance and influence. Um, yes. Oh, uh, on YouTube in uh, <laughs> under Mark Wilson's SRJC, right, for the college, Art History Lectures. And then you look it up by the class, because I, I put more than this class on there, but just this semester, there, are four, there will be four on Friday. This is the fourth week. So you look it up by the week, Art 2.1, and then week one, two, three, or four and you'll see the lecture if you missed it, okay? All right, now we gotta to get to the slides. We have a lot to cover tonight and it's not, none of it's, I don't think anyone would, would say uh, boring. <laughs> At least when you go to Egypt, 
it stays with you. Um, I, I think I know the answer to this question. It's so unusual, but there have over the years been uh, tours of uh, student group tours, not lately, of course, not for several years, but some of you may have been in college when those were happening at the JC or at Sonoma State or San Francisco State or UC Berkeley or wherever you might have attended besides the uh, Santa Rosa JC. Anybody here been to Egypt? Okay, well, that's one of the things you'll find after this lecture, that uh, I think you'll see the uh, fascination of that culture still permeates every part of that country that I've been to, and I've been all over Egypt, not just to Cairo and the Great Pyramids. So we'll see some of those slides in the last 20 to 25 minutes of class. All right, so the last thing to say before we get started with the first must-know slide to start taking notes is that there were three main periods in ancient Egypt. Uh, that are easy to remember. So I don't need to write those down. The Old Kingdom, I like to say that is the period of the Great Pyramids or the Pharaoh's Pyramids. A lot of people assume all the Pharaohs kept building pyramids. Oh, no, no, we'll talk about that. That's only early on during the Old Kingdom. Then the Middle Kingdom, when there was a lot of turmoil and conflict with neighboring kingdoms, and, uh, you know, turnover <laughs> at the top of their culture. We'll talk about that too. Uh, the era of Nefertiti and so forth. Uh, there we go. And then we have uh, also the New Kingdom, which you could say ends with Cleopatra. And the Romans come in and take over everything. So that, that's a 3,200-year-old stretch. Uh, there's no other culture that can claim a continuous system of government or governance, right? Language and religion with the minor interruption of uh, Amenhotep, which we'll talk about. Other than his brief divergence, they believed in the same gods, they had the same basic, basic uh, system of uh, government and uh, the same basic concepts of what was right and wrong and, and, and what mattered in life. Uh, and you know their religious beliefs and their cultural beliefs continuously for 3,200 years, no other culture can quite make that claim. All right, so now we're gonna do the screen share and we're gonna start with the first must know. So here that goes. All right, let's get that full screen. Let's do it. There we go. This is a really important work. So I've always said this, um, when that happens, you should, well, your choice, but if you want to make extra uh, efficient use of your time when you're studying for the midterm and the final, uh, you want to make sure you have flagged those slides that I am definitely not, while the notes are being taken or while I'm lecturing, so that when you go back to review, uh, you can spend more time reviewing in those slides. In other words, I'm not going to cut the ones that I tell you that are that important, and this is one of those. All right, here we go. It's the palette of Narmer. I'll spell these words once, as those of you have been, been with me for the first three weeks already know. Once is all we have time for. It's on your syllabus, of course. P-A-L-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Palette of Narmer, and that's N-A-R-M-E-R. -E and the location is Egypt, of course. And now this date has been bandied about with about a 200 year. That's a big differential. I go with the earlier date because that's what the uh, Cairo Museum, at least the last time I checked, and I spent two days in the Cairo Museum. Luckily, I found a couple of docents who spoke English and had even one of them taught at a university, I forget where it was, somewhere back east in the U.S. Uh, it was fascinating to have such guides and, and expertise. So I defer to the experts when it comes to that. So I'm going to give you the date that Stockstead, at least for a long time, had, and she's moved the date up a little to be a little uh, less ancient, but I mean, it's still almost 3000 years ago. So if you see that in her textbook, remember, I've said this again, but some of you might've missed that. What date you need to know for the exam or what's on the syllabus, okay? As well as the spellings, just to keep it simple so that we have a common standard template that you should uh, look at when you're studying, um, okay, for the exams. All right, so, we have on the syllabus 3100, 3150 BC. Some historians put it closer to 3000 BC, but we'll go with that uh, earlier date. 3150, that's nearly 5200 years old. So here are the facts you should have about the meaning of this piece. 
This is one of the earliest historical documents from ancient Egypt. It's really important. And one of the few found that documents, what does it document? It documents the beginning of the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. It documents that event in which the two halves of what were separate kingdoms, right? One was in the north, one in the south, Upper and Lower Egypt. It documents the events that led to the unification of Northern and Southern Egypt or Upper and Lower Egypt under one pharaoh. And of course, his name was Narmer. And we know which one he is in this because Egyptian art through that 3,000 plus year history I just mentioned, again, they had consistent symbolic uh, devices uh, or meanings for their symbols. And one of them is that whenever the Pharaoh, this is all part of the meaning now, whenever the Pharaoh was shown in a scene with other human figures, he was always the largest figure. That would tell us right there, the Pharaoh is a guy in the middle. Okay, another clue is part of the meaning again on this is what he's holding. It's a, a scepter, or you can say staff. The words are pretty synonymous. It's a symbol of uh, kings or royal, what well, not to be king or queen, actually, uh, a, a monarch, to say a monarch's uh, authority. And it seems to be universal. I, I don't know what it is about big sticks, but <laughs> it wasn't just Teddy Roosevelt that talked about carrying a big stick. Something about having, you know, a, a, a long, you know, symbol based on the shape of, or actually made out of a, a stick, usually wood, but sometimes metal. It's called a staff or scepter. That's S-C-E-P-T-E-R. Again, don't worry about the spelling of anything not on silver. So the scepter he's holding tells us, well, that's the pharaoh. But if that's not enough, there's a third clue. Now, my daughter, when she first came to visit me in my class and I showed this slide, you don't write this, she called this the bowling pin headdress. It does look like a giant bowling pin. It has that shape, but it's actually uh, the right way to write now, you should write this, is that Narmer, the pharaoh, is wearing the field headdress of a pharaoh or pharaoh's field headdress. There were two main types of headdresses. We'll see the other, the ceremonial one, which he wore in the palace, of course, and for ceremonies. So this is the field headdress he wore in the battle, in other words. So this is after he won his victory. How do we know that? Well, he's smiting the head of this man here. And um, now I'm going to mention this. I've said it a little bit, I think once only or so far this semester. There will be times when something with Stockstead, this is not exactly in, you know, line with something uh, either I'll tell you or that you could find by doing your own research. Like I said, I, I love Stockstead. It's a great book. Uh, actually, I didn't have one, you know, or more than one voice in adopting it, but I agreed we should adopt it. It's very inclusive and it's very broad based, beautifully illustrated, outrageously expensive, but otherwise a good book. However, no one book, no one historian can be right about everything. That'd be ridiculous. And I don't feel that I should be so arrogant as to think I'm an expert on everything. But but when I do research, I will always say this ahead of time, so hopefully this won't come up too many more times this semester, that disagrees with Stockstead, I will state that. And here's one example. She claims that this figure here is um, of equal size and importance. Uh, but at first, at least in the edition I have here, the most recent one I have, it's like 2016, I think, or 15, um, that um, that this figure is meant to be equal size to the pharaoh. First of all, do the math. If he was standing up, he wouldn't be quite as tall, and he certainly wouldn't be as muscular, and he's kneeling on top of everything else. So this is the defeated, the point. Here's now what you should write about that figure, the guy that's, you know, uh, kneeling in front of Narmer was the defeated pharaoh. You don't need to know his name. I don't even know, remember how to spell it. But he's being hit, smote, is how the Bible would say it, or some old text, you know, um, hit by the pharaoh who won the victory, who's now uh, asserting his supremacy, his dominance over his defeated enemy. And as if that's not enough, this is something Stockstead doesn't mention. This falcon here, there's two possible interpretations. It's Horus, the protector god of pharaohs who could uh, appear on earth as a, um, in you could say the form of a falcon, 
or he could be the Pharaoh himself because the Pharaoh could change into various gods on earth. Because the Pharaoh was, as some of you know this, if you didn't, you should write it. The Pharaoh was considered a minor deity on earth, not a major one, but a minor one, who had the power to disguise himself as, as certain types of creatures, uh, including a falcon, a vulture, or a cobra. That was one of the religious beliefs of the Egyptians. So I think this is, and many historians, just say it this way, many historians believe the falcon symbolizes armor, you know, in a different guise. In any case, this is the head, almost certainly with his, you know, headdress taken off because he's defeated. And guess what happens to defeated rulers in the ancient world? They had their heads cut off or otherwise were executed. So many historians, in other words, to summarize it, believe this is symbolic of Narmer converting or ch having changed himself into a falcon, literally <clears throat> showing off that he had just severed the head or ordered the execution of his defeated enemy. That makes perfect sense. And the museum in Cairo, at least the last time I checked with their docents, believe that. <clears throat> then we have a whole nother controversy over here. I'm sure if you read Stockstead, and I have to say more and more, I see the dispute is almost evenly divided between who is this guy? Well, the just say many historians, let's keep it simple. Many historians believe he's a sandal bearer. Stockstead says that, for instance. Okay, those could easily be sandals. They certainly look like sandals. But there's a couple of problems with that interpretation, and I don't agree with it. Neither did the docents that I talked to at the Cairo Museum. Why? Because Stockstead's rationale for that is, well, he has to carry sandals and follow the pharaoh because the, sand, the pharaoh was in bare feet which uh, is, is only when he's on holy ground. Oops, wait a minute. Take a look at all the images, even in Stockstead, or let alone on the internet or any other book about ancient Egypt. I have a really good uh, book by one of the top British, from the British Museum, uh, Egyptologist on the history of all of ancient Egypt. I just was rereading it before this lecture. Um, the pharaohs were almost always shown, whether it is in a bas-relief panel like this is, or full, you know, uh, sculptural figure, three-dimensional, or, or paintings, barefoot. It's just, that's the way they usually are portrayed, whether or not they were on sacred ground or, or doing something sacred, even just sitting next to their wife or something. So, so that doesn't indicate one way or the other whether uh, he needs to have a sandal bearer. And here's another problem with that interpretation. That's a pot of ink. It's a pot, at least again, let's put it this way, many historians again, We'll always say it that way. Believe that that is a pot of ink, which even has a slight hint of a writing instrument protruding from it. You have to really see it up close. I'm not sure if we can here. Let's see if we can. Uh, it's hard to tell, but it looks, uh, there you go, right. So if that is what it is, then we have two possible interpretations that he is, this man, is a scribe. That's what I believe. And that's what the Dawson's told me at the Cairo Museum. So you can write it either way or both and just make up your mind. There's no absolute right or wrong because we don't know. If he's a sandal bearer, why is he carrying a pot of ink? A, and why would a lowly sandal bearer be shown, uh, you know, in a scene so important? A scribe, oh yes, scribes would be shown with a pharaoh whenever they left the palace. Scribes were supposed to follow them and write things down. They were highly ranking, important people in Egyptian society. So it could be either, or some historians think both, which is a novel theory, that maybe this particular sandal bearer happened to get training as a scribe, uh, and therefore he did both. It's possible, so we, we just don't know. But let's go to the uh, next slide which is the reverse side of it. It's a two-sided piece of stone, that's what a pallet is, carved with scenes from some important event. Well, here's the Pharaoh here. This should be obvious. Look how big he is compared to everyone else. And here's again the, I'll just say, scribe slash sandal bearer. So keep it simple, <laughs> following the Pharaoh. Uh, and then here is probably his leading general because this man is shown more important then the soldiers, these are symbolic of the different, you know, that's not his entire army force. So just couldn't conquer Diddley with that. Obviously, these, these were, you know, symbolic of his entire legions. Well, the Romans use that word, but that, you know, different divisions of the uh, Egyptian royal army. What are they doing? They're holding a victory parade with their banners for each unit or outfit above them. And then this should be obvious. These are the defeated soldiers with their heads cut off and tucked between their legs, stacked on top of each other like blocks of wood or cords of wood. 
Um, that was the fate of most defeated uh, enemy uh, soldiers. Well, they had two, two possible fates. One was death <laughs> and the other was slavery. Um, so in this case, Narmer chose the more drastic punishment. Okay, and then we have these two creatures here, which again, uh, Jansen and Gardner describe, but uh, Stockstead doesn't, so I'll give you their interpretations. Uh, these sim are symbolic of Upper and Lower Egypt. They're mythical giraffe-like. They're not actual giraffes, look closely, but they're giraffe-like because their bodies don't jive with, but their necks make them look like giraffes. So you could say giraffe-like or mythical creatures. And they would represent Upper and Lower or Northern and Southern Egypt. And here they are intertwined, being controlled by handlers who are the local administrator, symbolic of the local regional, whatever governor we would say today, that would be appointed by Narmer to rule over those uh, provinces. Okay, and then uh, down here is a bull, which is symbolic of uh, one of two possible things. And that would be if Narmer was born, I don't think they know exactly what month under the sign of the bull. Yes, they believed in the signs of uh, the Zodiac back then. Uh, that would make sense because here it is again. And the other interpretation is these are just a different God because a minor God they believed in that could also benefit or protect the Pharaoh had uh, on earth often took the form of a bull. Well, that's a lot. You're not going to have to remember all of it. If it's on the uh, midterm, all you have to give me is half a page, you know, one or two paragraphs of information uh, about this. So now let's go back and do the formal analysis. The color is really this. This is a really good new slide. The last one of the back side is a little less accurate color-wise. It's, it's a cool gray color. And it's uh, bas-relief. What does that mean? Well, it means that all of the figures are formed with carved line. That's the only kind of line here. And the modeling is the lighting from the museum. Of course, the shadows around all the figures. So there is modeling and that's part of the composition because otherwise we wouldn't see the figures. So it's part of the design. So there is uh, modeling and there's realistic simulated textures on like the falcon's feathers and the pharaoh's uh, attire here his muscles even uh and then uh to some degree on these now oh by the way i didn't say what would be these be if these are not sandals they could be rolled up papyrus scrolls uh, adhered with clamps in the middle that's the other theory if if this guy is not a sandal bearer or not both a sandal bearer and a scribe. In any case, there's some similar texture here, even if we don't know 100% for sure what those objects are. Uh, and, and so there is good similar texture. It's quite well done here on some of the details. Uh, it is almost entirely stable, except, well, mostly, I better say, mostly, but because this obviously the, the back of the falcon here and the headdress on armor uh, and, you know, at least part of his arm, the uh, forearm there is, uh, is dynamic, but the figures are upright. Even the defeated, kneeling, uh, soon to be uh, beheaded, uh, losing Pharaoh here, even he's mostly stable. So it's both, but more stable than dynamic. And of course, there's the rhythm of the repeated uh, body parts, arms, hands, legs, feet, heads, and uh, some of the, the details here, obviously on the falcon and the clothing. Uh, and then we have uh, the largest figure. That's easy. It's the Pharaoh. And then the, the, the victorious one. We should just say Narmer. And then the defeated Pharaoh. And then it's a close call, but perhaps the Falcon. And then the uh, Sandal Bearer slash Scribe. Uh, and for space, this is important. This is one of the few examples you're going to see this whole uh, class of a clear-cut example of register line. This man, the pharaoh, is closer to us because he's on the lower line than the scribe slash sandal bearer in the back. He's supposed to be further away. He would follow many paces behind the pharaoh, of course. And then there is overlapping, of course. Right. Okay. Um, balance. It's roughly balanced, but some people feel because the falcon is so large that weighs it. But if you draw the line here, right up the you know middle of it, there's enough of the Pharaoh's body that I'd say it's roughly balanced, top to bottom and left to right, but you, you can decide that. Okay, and now on the other one, we have the same elements, so I'm not gonna repeat them. We've got overlapping just briefly. Uh, and uh, here, this is not register line though, on the back, um, which is odd maybe to some of you, but this is not two things happening at the same time. This is a symbolic panel meant to 
I just mentioned to to evoke the the new conquest recent conquest this would have been created within a few weeks after the the victory uh, in probably the royal palace by order of the pharaoh so at this point this is meant to symbolize the recently uh, accomplished unification of upper and lower egypt this is a, a, an event that occurred probably back at the royal palace after the victory was was completely secure and the enemy soldiers were executed. Um, <clears throat> so they're not two simultaneous events occurring in different spaces, further or closer. It's just they divided this side of this palette into two different panels. Okay. Um, and of course, again, it's mostly stable. Uh, the pharaoh's the largest mass in this section. Here's the two uh, long neck creatures. Uh, you can you can do most of that. So if it's on the exam, I'll only show you the front side. By the way, for formal analysis purposes. Okay. Wow. There. I forgot I had this new new image of it there. That is the real color. Uh, and of course, there's carved line modeling and simulated texture, obviously. All right. Now we're getting to the great pyramids. Now, this is a slide that I actually bought in Egypt. And I'm trying to decide which ones, one, I should say, is best to show you. And I think I'll go with this one. But I'm going to start with the lecture notes here. When we do the formal analysis, we'll, we'll look at these. How's that? But there's so many different views of the Great Pyramids. This one has one advantage. So let's first of all give you the, the facts, again, you should have at the heading of your notes. Great, two words, pyramids, plural, of course. Egypt, obviously, and the, the date, you could ignore the little c. That means we're, we're averaging out the date of these three structures, these three pyramids. 2600 BC or BC, E, if you prefer. So why do I start with this slide, even though it's a bit faded? Uh, well, because it's a better distant view of them uh, than the other two that the slide librarian had to, to share with me. Uh, even though the color doesn't quite, you know, evoke the real, uh, you know, tones of these three mammoth structures. Now, these you could literally call man-made mountains. Uh, they were constructed uh, by male laborers. We're going to talk about the myth about that uh, after we describe the main features. Uh, and I think most of you know, so here's what you should do now, if you didn't already. This slide, yeah, I'm not cutting it for the study guide. Uh, for, so you want to keep these notes and study them extra carefully. Okay, um, so you probably know they were used uh, as uh, burial sites uh, for pharaohs only during the Old Kingdom. Why? Why did they keep using pyramids? to bury the Pharaoh and all of his belongings, which as you probably knew was part of the purpose, to store their earthly belongings, all the portable ones, of course, uh, inside the burial chamber. Well, you probably guess, anybody, why, why would they stop doing that after several hundred years? Well, <laughs> the, the answer is probably self-evident, but uh, I, I understand most of the time on Zoom, I, I don't get, too many answers, but if anyone wants to chime in anytime, I don't mute my students, so please feel free. Uh, at least I didn't do it intentionally. No, I didn't. Yeah. Okay, so the reason is simple. They were too easy to rob. In fact, uh, they were picked clean within, oh, probably a few decades after the pharaohs died uh, by really determined grave robbers. And you don't have to have seen any Indiana Jones movies, as silly as those are. Nonetheless, there's some basis of fact for at least a few things in those movies, one of which is that there were booby traps in some of these sites, uh, not like in, in Spielberg's version. But uh, the, the, the many of the, the early grave robbers died in the attempt. Both well, okay, then, you know, Uncle, Uncle um, whatever his name was, right? He decides, Karnak, he decides, okay, I'm going to go rob the tomb. He doesn't come back. You figure, okay, he died. Some poison arrow, whatever it was, a, a large boulder. Those things actually have been proven to be used in some, of not all, of the pyramids. I don't know about these three. But there were dozens of, of uh, large pyramids with the old kingdom pharaohs. Many of them chose to keep doing that. But after a while, somebody got through. Maybe it was the nephew or two, three generations later. But eventually, someone got through and a whole you know, bunch of uh, valuables, uh, gold and you know, jewelry and, and uh, 
furniture and what have you, all those valuables were, were picked clean from these. So after a few centuries, a few centuries, uh, 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 during the old kingdom, uh, the pharaohs stopped using pyramids as their burial sites. But the pyramids were still used by non-pharaohs, lesser officials, and sometimes for the wives or other relatives of the pharaoh when they died. So let's take a look at your terms to know. Okay, we've been doing this every week, so by now you should be familiar. Uh, on the top or near the top of the second page, I'm not going to ask you to write definitions for all five of these things, but you should be aware the Egyptians are credited with inventing the first documented versions of all five of these things. Frescoes, columns, we're going to see all of these tonight, temples, flat-sided pyramids. Remember, we covered what the step pyramids are ziggurats, and the Babylonians or uh, ancient Near Eastern cultures invented those. So flat side pyramids are an Egyptian idea. And obelisks, we're going to see all of those. The one thing I took off the list I used to have, and um, I might put it back on, is written language. Why? Because there's a debate over that, and it's gotten more heated, and there's uh, equally strong evidence to say that the Babylonians, like we saw last week, remember, with the uh, Stele of Hammurabi, the first law code or the oldest law codes we found. Those are nearly 4,000 years old, and there's no question that's written language, actual sentences written out in an alphabet. That's what we mean by written language. The Egyptians had hieroglyphs or hieroglyphic language before, but that's not the same as an alphabet. That's using pictures or pictographs, uh, symbols, if you want to say it that way, uh, to create uh, you know, the meaning of the concept of, you know, a passage or, or a sentence uh, of some kind. And so hieroglyphics go way back to the earliest uh, uh, pharaohs, at least as far back as an armor. But written language is more uh, you know, sophisticated and, and more complex. And that usually appeared around 4,000 years ago, about the time of the uh, both cultures beginning to write down things in uh, alphabetic language both the Babylonians and Egyptians. Okay, so this gives you an idea. There are three great pyramids. So these are the facts you should be writing if you don't already know these. The, the largest of the three is the Great Pyramid, this one here. We're gonna look at it up close and then I'm gonna show you what it looks like to go right up to the entrance and then tell you a story about a rather frightening incident that occurred when I went inside the Great Pyramid with my two Oakland high school teacher friends that we the three of us were touring Egypt when I was there. Uh, something that happened that um, is a is an object lesson of not, what not to do when you go visit the Great Pyramids or any place that has a small confined tunnel like entrance. But we'll get to that at the end of tonight. Okay, so that the where the arrow is, that's the largest pyramid. I know this picture doesn't make it look that way, but it's called. This is part of the meaning now of this very complex set of facts here for this uh, slide in the syllabus. The Pyramid of Khufu. Now that I could have written out, but it's so easy to spell. Uh, so it's K-H-U-F-U. K-H-U-F-U. The Pyramid of Khufu is the largest pyramid. When it was new, here are the facts about it, why, why we know that's true. It was 480 feet tall. 480, but almost 500 feet. That's the equivalent of a 48-story skyscraper. And nothing else on Earth matched the height of that human built structure. And some of you, uh, well, I'll go ahead and give it a shot. Anybody know what structure sometime in the late 1800s overtook the height of the Great Pyramid as the tallest structure on earth? It's still standing. It's in France. Okay. <laughs> the right, Eiffel Tower, I heard one of you say, yeah, that's almost a thousand feet. But that's 1889. That is, again, darn near 4,500 years later. So in other words, to write it now, if you want to keep it simple, the Great Pyramid of Khufu was the tallest uh, human built or uh, it was man-made. It was, but we know there weren't female laborers here. There were in other parts of Egypt, but not on the sites here. So we can say man-made built structure on earth for nearly 4,500 years. That's a remarkable record to have stood uh, uncontested. Okay, it's missing the top 20 feet. You don't have to add that fact, but that's a fact. So now it's 460 feet. This one is the only one of the three, the second largest, 
that had any part of the limestone cap that the whole exteriors of all three were, were sheathed or covered in. All three of these pyramids were once covered in uh, smooth limestone over that rough stone that you see there and then painted blinding white. So you might want to write that because originally they didn't look like this. They didn't have the sand colored stone that you see now. They, they had uh, plastered limestone. The limestone itself was then covered in plaster, then that was painted white. Blinding white. Can you imagine seeing these? You could see them from 75 miles away on a clear day. Uh, they were meant to be seen from a great distance. And the smallest one was the first one. Uh, this one is the Pyramid of Khafre. You don't have to know his name. Uh, it's good to, you should know Khufu's the largest pyramid. But if you want to write the second largest pyramid, which is about 330 feet, I think it is, just say over 300 feet. That one is um, K-H-A-F-R-E, Khafre. Okay, and then I don't remember the name of this one because it's the smallest and uh, least impressive, but they're all impressive when taken together. Now let's go take a look at a closer view and I'll tell you some of the myths about the Great Pyramids. I think this is a, a more accurate um, set of a, a view, whether these, these three uh, show up sharper, obviously here, and yet they're so much closer together. Uh, that you, you don't get quite the context, I think, is the first slide. But if it's on the exam, I'll, I will show this slide. Because if you're doing a formal analysis, you got to have the sharpest images. Okay, so we're looking at, uh, again, this is Khafre's with the limestone cap left still. The top missing, you see here on uh, Khufu's. And then there, I believe, the grandfather of uh, Khafre. See, Khufu and uh, Khafre were father and son, I believe that's right. And then this guy, he uh, had the smallest pyramid because when the first pyramids of these three were built, you know, there wasn't the other two to compete with it, right? So I didn't consider whoever built that one, the probably grandfather of the other two pharaohs, that it was so important to make it huge. I mean, it's big enough. It's, it's a good 130 feet or so, well over 100 feet. Okay, so here are some of the myths about them. But let, again, I always like to ask if anyone cares to chime in, that's fine if you don't. Um, does anybody know, know who, what kind of laborers built the Great Pyramids? Well, well, Jewish slaves. Yeah, that's a nice myth that Hollywood has been propagating uh, and so have many other um, you know, uh, mass cultural sources. No. They had no slaves of any ethnic origin, even, you know, enemy soldiers who were converted into slaves for hard labor, um, ever were allowed to work at this site. It would have been a sacrilege. This is one of the myths I like to try, and you can check this out for yourself, for that to happen. Why? Because these were the burial sites of the most important figure, a god on earth, literally a perfect and most powerful human being that everyone in Egypt looked up to as a father figure, among other things, as well as their uh, absolute ruler. Uh, so they were paid laborers. They were citizens of Egypt, and they had differentiated, you can say, you know, specialized tasks. There were hard laborers today, we might use the word teamsters, who had to do the pushing and lifting of the huge stones, which, by the way, here's a fact to write down, each stone in all three of these Great Pyramids weighs between two and four tons. <laughs> That's, right, four to 8,000 pounds per stone. You can imagine that that is obviously a, a major, uh, you know, task to get those stones to the site. Now, there were slaves. Of course there were, uh, and, and many of them were the, the Jewish slaves. I mean, that part of whatever you want to think of, you know, various stories about, uh, <clears throat> right, the Bible and, and all that, that, that's your business. But we know there were, you know, Jewish slaves who were allowed to leave by Ramses, and they had a leader named Moses. That, that's not, you know, myth, that part. So I'm not talking about that. I, they, they cut the stones way down the river, hundreds of miles south of there along the Nile in the mountains of southern Egypt. So you could say they had some role in it, but they did not do, no slaves of any kind worked on these pyramids. So they were paid. How do we know that? The records have been found. They were given uh, regular uh, daily wages and they had paid holidays. They had room and board provided on the site. They found evidence of their actual inhabitants around the bases of the pyramids. And they had a union. 
they wouldn't call it a union, it would have been a guild, or whatever the ancient Egyptian word was, but you know, a, an organization to um, negotiate with the government, literally, who else, right? Uh, for wages and, and, you know, raises and, you know, days off. Yeah, that, that's been well proven. So it's a surprise, I know, for, for many people. I didn't used to know that either until I finally went to Egypt and then started reading more about it. Because at first I didn't even want to believe that, but it's been well, well verified. So there were uh, paid laborers of all uh, levels of skill. Some of them were just, you know, doing the heavy lifting and some were doing the carving and some were the foremans and supervisors and then the skilled, you know, uh, stonemasons and so forth. And of course, eventually the plasterers and painters, you know, you can see multiple, it was a major public work project. They estimate 20,000 people on average worked on each pyramid for up to 20 years to finish from start to finish, took about 20 years for all three of the pyramids. So we come up with the age of 2600 BC or BCE based on the median period of time during which each one was under construction. So the oldest ones are more like 2,640. I, I think the oldest one is this one, I'm pretty sure. In any case, it doesn't matter which is the oldest. What matters is the largest, and you have that information. So last fact now about uh, the meaning of the, and then we'll do a form analysis, of the Great Pyramid only. Well, actually, a couple facts. I just said the stones were two to four tons each. There are 2.3 million, or you could round it off and say roughly two and a third million stones in the Great Pyramid. And so it is by far, it was not only the tallest, but the most massive human-made or man-made structure on Earth for thousands of years. I don't think any calculator, a computer could, of course, could figure out what that weight would be, the aggregate weight of all those stones. If you take the average or median weight of the stones, you know, the, the bigger ones are on the bottom, of course, uh, and the top ones. And, and so the median would be, let's see, three tons, that's 6,000 pounds, times 2.3 million. And it's an astronomical figure of the weight of these stones. Someone want to do the calculation? You can do that and email it to me, and I'll mention it uh, in class next week. I won't have time to check my email tonight, um, and you'll get extra credit. Um, anyway, it, it's massive, right? So that's why we say a man-made mountain. And then another fact about it is uh, that um, these are the, this group of pyramids, the Great Pyramids, taken together, are one of only two uh, human-built sites on earth but again in this far back we can say the other one is also was man-made in that there weren't any female laborers on this other site there are also only in other one other site on earth that can be seen from a hundred miles up in space by astronauts obviously uh on a clear day the great pyramids anybody know what the other one is the great wall of china yes absolutely yeah you guys got it yeah yeah and um i have not yet been there it's one of the few things on my bucket list <laughs> i would love to go anybody here been to the great wall of china because at this point, that would be uh, extra credit if you wanted to share slides of that and send me just a few images. In any case, among my friends who I have seen slides from my other teacher friends who've been there, it's pretty impressive, but it is not as tall. I mean, that's massive, and it goes for thousands of miles across. I don't have slides. I went, and there's like a toboggan oh. ride. Oh, okay. And that was This was outside of Beijing, but you like up these stairs to the top of the the, the the wall and then they have like basically like a bobsled ride that goes down from the <laughs> wall like onto the ground and um i remember like looking both ways and both ways the wall went like as far as i could see some of it was kind of uh i messed up and like had fallen apart but it still went you know as far as i could see um yeah. well, past the horizon right yeah, yeah it, it was pretty it was pretty crazy i was seven at the time how would you estimate the height of it? I've heard 40 feet. I've heard 30. I've heard 50. What do you think? It sort of varies depending on where you're oh, at. But yeah. I would okay. say, honest, I would probably say about 40 to 50 feet where I was at because where, where we were at, there was still um, like uh, guard houses and stuff. Oh. And as it went down further, um, I remember looking towards like Mongolia and looking to my right. And as it went down further, you could see where it started to sort of um, drop in height as like rocks and stuff had gone missing and bricks and stuff had gone missing. No. Oh. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, it's uh, 2000. It's closer to, well, it depends. Parts of it are newer than other parts, right? It was begun 
I believe, in the earliest phase of Chinese uh, urban society. Yeah, there, there are parts of it that are like... 3,000 years old? Or whatever. Yeah, and they, they look they look it too. They look like they've been um, built by much more primitive tooling than the later parts of the wall. And then some of them were uh, strengthened or rebuilt. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But the pyramids, nothing's been done to them, by the way. And yes, Bo, last thing, you don't have to write this, and then let's get to a quick formal analysis because we've got to get the pay, pick the pace up a little bit here. Uh, the um, <clears throat> uh, fact that these, um, you know, were entered by almost every famous conqueror that ever took over Egypt. Some of you know this. The two most famous visits were Alexander the Great and Napoleon. And Alexander the Great and Napoleon both went inside the Great Pyramid. They had to go here, all the way, which I've done. It's, I'll tell you how, what it feels like in, in uh, the end of the, this evening. Uh, in any case, they came out, both of them, their faces ashen white is how their own, uh, you know, aides described, like they'd seen a ghost, you know, and they wouldn't, neither one, Alexander the Great nor Napoleon, would say what they saw. But later on, people who were their closest aides said they eventually said they saw something about their own future. Well, they both died not too pleasantly in different ways. Napoleon on an island, isolated from a horrible infection that was painful and it took him months to die. And Alexander in battle, slashed to death. Uh, and they both died younger, even for the time they were they lived in. Alexander in his 30s and Napoleon barely 50. Even for those times, it was relatively young for upper, you know, ruling class people. So, so maybe they saw their own deaths. Who knows? <laughs> Don't write that part. Okay, let's uh, move on now to the formal analysis. Uh, the color here is sand colored. Just keep it simple. Therefore, of course, that's a warm tone. Uh, the rhythm is obvious. The shapes are identical, but each row of, of uh, stones creates rhythm as well. Uh, so it's stable on the rows or block, just say on the individual stones, each one is stable, but the overall shapes are dynamic, of course, as a pyramid by definition, especially flat-sided pyramids would be. Uh, and then in uh, mass, it's pretty easy. You've got Khufu, Khafre, and then the first or smallest one in that order. You know, um, so here, here they're arranged in descending order. So if this is on the exam, it'd be easy to remember the relative masses. And there are only three masses. Uh, for size, I already mentioned this. Just say this is over 100 feet. I know it's well over, it's like 140. So say well over 100. Uh, this one is over 300. And the Great Pyramid originally was 480. That's the real size of these. You don't have to remember the number of stones. Uh, that was 2.3 million in the Great Pyramid. I don't know the count for the other two. Uh, and then we have uh, texture. There's no semantic texture. It's a real rough texture of the stone. The modeling is the shadows from the sun. There, uh, of course, natural modeling. And then there is the um, uh, visual effect of line. It's called visual line, where the corners or edges, right, uh, are visually you know, visible because of the modeling. So there's no carved line uh, visible here. Uh, and then we have uh, balance. Each one is balanced. No question. By definition, they're going to be stable. Uh, I'm sorry, Adam is stable. Uh, they're going to be balanced left to right, but unbalanced, of course, toward the bottom. Okay. Any questions before we move on? All right. Now we get to see something that sent shivers down my spine when I stood underneath it and looked up at it. Uh, this is not my own slide. It was very similar to one that I took, but that slide I haven't had a chance to copy. Uh, I hate to even give it to a copy center or some kind, you know, or tech, tech lab to do, because if it's gone, it's, I'll never get it back. So I just show it to my friends when I can. I haven't had friends over like most of us for six months, but uh, once a year, at least when I do a party or something, I'll show my slides. In Egypt, I usually get people asking to see them. Okay, so I've stood right where this photo was taken. Okay, so it's the next must know, and you all know what it is. The Great Sphinx, S-P-H-I-N-X, Egypt, of course, 2570 BC, 2570 BC. So there is a debate over the meaning of this. And you'd think that it should be obvious, and on one level it is. What is a Sphinx? It is a mythical creature, 
from ancient Egyptian mythology or religion, they believed they actually existed. So you could say from their religious beliefs, uh, which had the head of a pharaoh and the body of a lion. That, that's a short way to say it. And if you didn't already know that or isn't obvious, you should write that. Okay, so this is an old view. So let's see a slightly more recent one. They've been restoring it. You can see that in this view here. Uh, and of course, it's got some uh, deterioration. Well, it is 2,600, no, 4,600 years old. <laughs> so this is an important part of the meaning. It is unlike the Great Pyramids. It is not an assembled piece of sculpture or structure. It's carved out of the living desert rock. Look there. You could see it, literally this was a hill. And now the head may have been constructed, but even if the evidence is that it's not pieced together. So there was some kind of a hill here in the desert. And whoever the then architect for the Pharaoh was, was assigned to carve this figure out of the living rock is the phrase. That sounds funny because rock is alive. Well, actually many religious groups believe like Native American religions do. Uh, animists, they're called some of them uh, in Africa, also believe rocks have, you know, spirits in them. So whatever your belief is, just write it that way, that this piece of sculpture was not created by accretion or assembling, those are the two words, uh, pieces from somewhere else. It was created on the site by carving out of the desert itself or the desert rock. Okay, uh, but wh who or what does it symbolize? Well, there's where the debate is. Well, here's the Pyramid of Khafre. We just talked about it. So if it's on the exam, I'll show this slide because this is a better one. Um, uh, these are relatively new that I was just able to obtain from uh, the slide library at Santa Rosa JC before the shutdown. Okay, so what we have here uh, is the head of a pharaoh. Which pharaoh? Well, there's where the debate is. Wouldn't it have to be Khafre? Because look, his pyramid is right behind. But there are two problems with that theory. So just say one theory is that it's, uh, an image of the Pharaoh Khafre whose pyramid it stands closest to, keeping it simple. But what of the competing theory that that isn't true? Why? Because if any one of these three ego maniacal rulers, don't write that, but whatever, you know, come on, they're building monuments to themselves while they're alive, of course, that are bigger than anything else in their kingdom. Of course, they had huge egos. What else is this all about, right? Uh, so why would only one of the three uh, have? a sphinx, and there's no evidence there was another smaller or larger sphinx. There's a smaller pyramid, we can't see the, the larger one, the great pyramid's off the, the uh, frame of the picture. So why wouldn't either one or both of the other two put their own sphinx in front of there? That's one problem with that theory, that this is a portrait of Khafre, which it could be, but I don't think it is. The other is that um, there are um, sphinx figures all over ancient Egypt, dozens of them, uh, well, more hundreds really, have been found that have the same, almost exactly the same features on the face. So let's go and I'll prove that to you. Oh, yeah, there. This is my own slide now. This is in the basement of the Louvre. Yes, there is a basement at the Louvre. Go there when you're in Paris. Why? Because it has the best food court I've ever seen. It's amazing. Hey, it's in France, right? I mean, it's got food from all over the world, not just their former colonies and all the French things you can think of that you may or may not uh, already know, but also food from every culture on earth. It's amazing. And then most tourists never know this, but I am lucky enough to have friends that live in Paris and knew the docents or one set of docents. They got us with a lock and key. They were locked behind a locked door down a tunnel, way below even the food court, which itself is below the museum. Another level down are the artifacts they don't have room for to display. And one of them is the second largest Sphinx ever found. Look at it. It's 30 feet long and 15 to 20 feet tall. And I stood here and it was a good three or four times taller than me. And this has the same almost exact features, plus which we have evidence now that these tend to, these sphinxes, or here's the other theory, in other words, if it's not the portrait of Khafre, then what could it be? A general image to symbolize the might, or you can say power and majesty, that's a better way to say it. it, it that these sphinxes, all of them pro could easily have been many historians believe, they were just meant to symbolize 
the uh, power and majesty of the pharaohs, plural in general. And it makes more sense. It just does when you look at the context. But it could be it's just a portrait of Khafre, the, the guy whose pyramid it sits closest to. We don't know. There's no, not enough written records to verify. Okay, so that's pretty much the whole meaning here, uh, except that it's been greatly restored since even this picture was taken. Uh, and uh, it was for the year 2000. It was the site of one of the main millennial celebrations. I've ever seen that live on TV, you know, in, in Egypt when it struck midnight. There was a huge bunch of fireworks and things set off right, right nearby. And so it's been uh, constantly uh, repaired or maintained over the millennia. Oh, there is one myth about it. So let's go to this last one and then we'll do the formal analysis. You see the nose is missing? Okay. Well, there's a myth. Some of you may have heard it. That Napoleon's soldiers shot the nose off. Yeah. No, it was missing for centuries before that. We know that because European travelers to Egypt wrote books about their trips, and some of those were bestsellers in their day, right? I mean, you know, a few hundred copies since they were all hand printed, right? <laughs> well, actually, some of the later ones were, were printed if by the 1600s. There were tourists, groups of tourists going to Egypt from wealthier parts of Europe. And they already had drawings, you know, done by some artists for those books who was along on that group tour. And the nose was missing for hundreds of years before Napoleon arrived. So we know it wasn't him. So there's two theories. One is it was the Turks. That makes sense to me, but there's no way to know for sure. The Turks occupied Egypt along with the entire Middle East, all of North Africa. They had a huge empire, and we're going to talk about them later on in this class. Uh, people often don't even know about them. It was a powerful, wealthy empire for hundreds of years, and they didn't particularly respect the local cultures they occupied. That's been well documented. And uh, yeah, they could have used this for target practice or otherwise done some damage for souvenirs for some of the soldiers to take home. It's hard to say, but a more likely explanation is time and weather. You know, it's the desert. They have sandstorms. You don't have to have seen the mummy, the one with Rachel Weiss, right? <laughs> to know that sandstorms come up out of nowhere in Egypt. And I got to see a couple though. So I can tell you, they can come out with almost no warning and they can do, it's like, you know, sandblasting something, only much more powerful than a single sandblasting tool would ever be. So, so it could easily just be worn down. But then the question is, why wasn't the rest of his face worn down? Because it could have been faulty construction, you could say, or added a piece, or maybe when they carved it, they actually weakened it from the rock and it was not as you know, strongly attached. There are all kinds of theories. We don't know. Could you, in other words, the two main theories are it could have been Turkish soldiers or it could have been just the effects of time. All right, formal analysis. Well, this will be easy because the colors are very much obvious. Sand color, and that's an earth tone, of course. It is balanced. Um, I would make the argument it's, un yeah, slightly wider, slightly wider. So it's unbalanced from the bottom, but definitely symmetrical left to right. Uh, there is no larger or smaller mass, but for size, you should know this. It is, oh, I meant to say this under meaning. So you can write it now or put it back under meaning if you want to add it to the margin. This is the largest sculpture was, sorry, the largest sculpture, sculpted figure on earth until the 20th, I'm sorry, until the uh, 19th century, until the 1800s, just say it that way. And that then became the, so we already know, Statue of Liberty is 205 feet tall, I think. This is 165 feet long by 70 feet tall. That's what you should write under space because it's a real space. It's a solid piece, so it's a single mass, and it is 70 feet tall and 165 feet long. If you're curious, the next largest piece in the ancient world that I know of, maybe I've overlooked something, uh, was the Colossus of Rhodes, which was 105 feet. Okay, this is, the, in other words, if this, you know, were to stand up to figure, hypothetically, of a sphinx, it, it would have been by far taller than any other figure, including the Colossus of Rhodes in ancient Greece. So it was the largest uh, single piece of sculpture in the world that we have do documented, you know, known piece uh, for thousands of years till the 1800s. Okay, and then we have the rhythm of the paws, of course, and the facial features, the eyes, the ears, the lips. And those are created with carved lines. So there is simulated texture, but most of the body now, because it's worn down, even after it's been restored, they've only restored sections like the paws. And so most of the body is the real rough texture of the rock or stone. 
uh, and then we have it stable, really stable. The only thing slightly dynamic really is the headdress and maybe the eyes and the ears. So it's almost entirely stable. Um, and then uh, we have, let's see, rhythm balance. Oh yeah, modeling is of course just the shadows. There's no technique for modeling. Shadows from the sun and carve line creates these simulated textures. Um, let's see, I think I covered everything there, yeah. By the way, it's not hollow. There's no treasure trove in or underneath it. That's another myth I read somewhere. Oh, there must be a, you know, a, a treasure a story, you know, compartment in it. No, no, it was not used for that. Okay, so moving on to the next must know. Okay, I'm going to give you a break on um, notes. I'm just going to show you this because I do like to do this every so often. You don't have to write this, but you could if you want to in case you might want to write uh, for extra credit. Uh, I meant write, find an article about this or not, uh, or even possibly consider it for your first paper. This is a, a life-size um, dual sculpture of um, a future pharaoh, a prince, a pharaoh in waiting and his wife, Prince Rahotep, don't ask me to spell it, it's like it sounds with an R, Prince Rahotep and his queen, his wife, well then she was princess, and princess no fret, I love that, N-O-F-R-E-T. Okay, she never worried, right? Why am I showing it to you? Well, look at the difference in their skin tones. This has, I'm sure, occurred to most of you, if not all of you, that it, when you see different images of Egyptian uh, pharaohs and other figures, uh, quite often they're covered in gold or some other non-lifelike color, right? These are the skin tones of the husband or future pharaoh, the prince, and not the natural skin tones of the wife or princess. Why would she be shown with pancake-like white makeup on? Well, there's a logical reason because upper-class women actually did wear, especially the ruling classes, uh, such makeup in ancient Egypt, at least for most of their history, at least until the uh, late uh, New Kingdom period. Uh, Cleopatra didn't, for instance, and I don't think other members of her generation. But for most of their history, the ancient Egyptian ruling classes, the women would wear this. Uh, the, uh, what, anybody know why? It's two reasons. What could be the purpose? There's actually one symbolic and one is uh, uh, practical. Well, okay, it's getting late. <laughs> uh, the symbolic purpose is it was considered a sign of beauty and wealth. Well, it would be because the average you know, working class or we'd say today middle-class wife and couple couldn't afford that, right? So yeah, only the upper classes had the wherewithal. But more importantly is it was a protection against the sun to protect the complexion. But then that begs the question, you don't have to write any of this, but I think this is maybe one of the most important points I ever make in each night that I lecture about Egypt. And it's one of my favorite facts about the ancient Egypt that you can't say about any other ancient culture and some would say any current culture on earth today. Okay, if you look at the point I'm trying to make here is the underlying message here is, if you look at the different images, and we're gonna see several after the break, like Tut, uh, right? Or some of the other pharaohs and some of their relatives. And if you read the history of Egypt, you'll find that they were often uh, the rulers we're talking about, because that's what we have images of, right? We don't have too many uh, portraits of the commoners, but what we know is among the ruling classes, in ancient Egypt for 3,000 years, they had a, a variation, you could say, or a variety, if you want to say, or altering, alternating, that's a better word, alternating, um, periods when they had rulers who were dark-skinned, some would say sub-Saharan or black African, some who were mixed race, with one parent from that, and the other would be North African or pre-Arabic, and then later on, they intermingled with uh, Alexander the Great conquered them. So they, those were Europeans, of course, from Greece. And so uh, then they were mixed race that way. In other words, they were the first multicultural society on earth. They had no hangups about race. They didn't care what you looked like. They cared about what you did. And that's an amazing fact that to me makes them culturally a, 
millennia, I can't even say centuries ahead of most of the rest of the world, if you think about it. And we're dealing with issues like that already. Uh, I mean, again, already. I mean, yet again in my lifetime, my goodness. I've seen it multiple times. Uh, right now, not just in the streets, obviously. Uh, so the point is, the Egyptians weren't hung up about race. And you can go through the Louvre, which has the largest collection in Europe, or the Cairo Museum, which is unlikely, you're not likely to get to Egypt. Uh, anytime soon, but if you ever do, you'll see what I'm talking about, as I have, both museums. And you'll see all the collection of sculptures with the different skin tones, and you'll see the variety of, you know, sometimes from one generation to another, it would switch from a, a dark-skinned Black African or mixed-race ruler to a lighter-skinned North African or mixed-race with uh, one of the outside, you know, lighter-skinned uh, tribes that they conquered. You know, it, they weren't hung up about race. It's pretty amazing, if you think about it, that far back. That isn't true of almost any other culture. Okay, we're going to take a break after this. This is a really important slide, and I think I have the... Yeah, I'm going to show you this view. Let's stick with this view. Okay, this is uh, the uh, bust of Nefertiti. Bust, of course, is just like it sounds. Nefertiti is N-E-F-E-R-T-I-T-I. -T -T -I. Egypt, of course, and the date is 1348 BC. So you could just write 1340 if you want on the exam. Okay, so she was one of the few co-rulers, or actual rulers, sorry, let me rephrase it. Uh, I'll start over. This is a portrait of one of the few females who was an actual ruler, not in name only, or through a husband, but actually had power, exercised power. But she was a co-ruler because she chose with her husband, I already held up his... The, the spelling of his name at the beginning, so I won't spell it again. Amenhotep was her husband. The two of them were co-rulers. So when he was away from the palace, she ruled alone because he would take trips for varieties of reasons around a large kingdom, right? And vice versa. When she would go travel around different provinces of their kingdom, and if he stayed behind, he would rule solely. But most of the time, they ruled side by side. They were co-equals, in other words co-rulers is the right way to say it. That was really rare in the ancient world. And there was only two other women that had real power in ancient Egypt. And those were Hatshepsut. We'll see uh, a slide about her after the break. And of course, you all know Cleopatra, the last Egyptian pharaoh. That's it. Three women who had full power. So they weren't, you know, egalitarian in that sense, but no other culture in the world was except one. We'll get to them next week. The Minoans, some think they were the actual Atlantis culture. They had equality between the sexes, but that's so rare in much of the world now, but then in the ancient world is, is almost unheard of. So they allowed women to have importance and influence and be high priestesses and uh, even political uh, advisors, uh, you know, and, and uh, various influence on the Pharaoh, but, but uh, very rarely were the actual ruler. She was. Okay, this was a life mask portrait done from her face by wax impression, found intact. You're going to say, wait a minute, it's missing. Yeah, well, just listen, hear me out. It was found intact in the original artist's studio. And that studio was intact with many other busts and portraits of her. She was so popular, so famous, and so well-loved throughout ancient Egypt that uh, she almost had a cult following and she was considered the wisest, you know, most intelligent, most beautiful woman in the kingdom. And so her portrait was in demand. So Tutmos was his name. That's T-H-U-T-M-O-S-E if you want to write it. Uh, you could just spell it how it sounds. So Tutmos was the royal portrait maker, uh, you know, sculptor, of course, at this point, they weren't doing portrait paintings. Yeah. Uh, very often. I mean, they did, but not, you know, easel paintings, right? So what we have here is a life image of one of the most powerful women in the history of the entire ancient world. And it shows her self-confidence, I think, and her uh, strength and her obvious intelligence and focus on what she was going to do. Well, what was that? She chose with her husband, the two of them together, to overthrow all of the old religious cults to uh, outlaw them, actually, and replace them. Uh, I held this paper up at the beginning, but if you weren't here, I'll spell this for you, with a new god, only one god, no other culture except the Jews. <laughs> they were around this far back, but uh, had 
a one God or monotheist. That's the right word, mono, one word, theist culture or religion, I should say. And they were the only ones in the ancient Egyptian history to do that. And they replaced all the other gods with, I'll keep it simple, Ra. There's two names for them. Aten, A-T-E-N, is the same as Ra, R-A, easier to spell you remember Ra was what the sun god they said only the sun god that had been around before as part of the earlier beliefs could still be worshipped well you could guess it doesn't take too much analysis to figure out that caused all kinds of resentment and anger lots of people the average citizen some of them didn't want to give up their old gods and then the whole priest class oh were they ticked off <laughs> they were losing their you know livelihood <laughs> and expelled from their temples. The temples were closed. So only a few years after that happened, there was a rebellion, a bloody rebellion that overthrew their joint rulership. But here's the irony. Uh, uh, Akhenaten, that's his new name, right? Akhenaten. Uh, and again, I'll, no, I'm not going to spell it. We, we need to keep moving. I already put it in the uh, introductory right? images you, some of you have now gotten through the help of your fellow student. Okay, so Akhenaten was not uh executed you think he would they lost the rebellion was successful in overthrowing this couple a as a joint ruler you know ruling entity and also overthrowing their forced new religion people went back to believing in all the old gods what happened was the husband um akhenaten survived and was allowed to keep the throne but as a figurehead he had to agree to allow the old religions to be replaced or uh, renewed. Uh, and she disappeared. No one knows what happened to her. There is still searches being done every time I check the news. I see there, you know, history of uh, modern Egypt, uh, news, news releases and the internet. No one's found her tomb or her mummy or any evidence of how she died. All we know is she disappeared from the palace. There's a mystery, and there's, there's lots of theories, but no absolute 100% concrete proof. So we could just say it's a mystery of history, I like to put it that way, in which she disappeared sometime after that rebellion overthrew them, and he was allowed to stay on as a figurehead uh, ruler. The old religions were restored, and she disappeared, along with her children. The theories range from that she died in the rebellion to she was exiled or chose to you know, emigrate to a neighboring kingdom, and, and sought their protection. Or some people think that she disguised herself as a man. Mm, that seems a little far-fetched, but it's possible. Uh, what she did with her children, I don't know. Or she stayed on and disguised herself as a man and was the uh, advisor to Akhenaten behind the throne. But that one really seems far-fetched. So no one knows is the point. Okay, formal analysis, we'll take a break. It is completely balanced, totally balanced. I think even though the headdress looks wider here, I think when you add, if you draw the line here, the width and mass, let's just say the mass, covered by her necklace, shoulders, neck, and lower half of her head, I think it's roughly balanced. But if you want to say it looks slightly unbalanced toward the top, I wouldn't argue. It's superb similar texture, all done with painted line. This is painted. There's a little bit of carved line, of course, that you'd have to say both. I'm sorry, there's both. I shouldn't just say mostly painted, because you do see the line carved on her lips, her eyes, and the necklace. But most of the texture we, we notice on the skin, right, and the surface of each object, the, the headdress all the way down to the necklace, is all done with painted lines. The colors warm on her skin tones and a mixture of warm and cool on her necklace. And then neutral, that's black, almost looks like it's turned into dark, dark blue, but it would have been very dark blue, almost uh, black, and then her, her eyebrows. So there's some neutral and some cool colors, uh, obviously, here on her headdress. Now, what happened to her? One last fact about the meaning. Uh, I didn't quite finish. One eyeball, yes, both eyeballs were in place, intact, and both ears were perfectly preserved when it was found. Some German archaeologist, I'm going to call him a thief, I don't know what else to call him, took this bust without permission, stole it. I mean, that's really the only word in 1910 from Egypt secretly in the dead of night got it out of egypt and took it to berlin was where it is now i've seen it it's in a museum in the city of berlin and the outer uh, regions of uh, the city uh, limits of berlin it's called the egyptian museum and the only reason people go there is to see this <laughs> well there are other artifacts that are interesting that that's a crime i don't think anyone would argue even back then that was against the law 
and they damaged it is the point. The damage you see was done in transit by those thieves. <laughs> Somewhere between leaving Egypt and arriving in Berlin, they dropped it. <laughs> Can you imagine this? Like, what? It's bad enough you stole something from another culture and then you go and drop it. Uh, yeah, no place deep enough in hell for people like that in my mind, but anyway. So we'll wrap it up now with, uh, let's see, there is um, a single mass. Well, you could break it down and say the headdress is clearly larger than her head and then the necklace is third. For space, it's only overlapping, except for the fact it's a, lar a three-dimensional life-size human head. Uh, so that's real space, but there is the overlapping of the headdress and the necklace and the obvious rhythm of the eyes and ears. And then it is mostly stable uh, because she's looking straight at us when you look at it this way, except for the necklace and the top of the headdress. And then of course the details of the eyelids and the lip. So it's, it's both. All right, let's take a break. It's uh, yeah, about the right time. 20 minutes. Let's keep it to that. Cause we have a, still a few more slides. Yeah, there we go. I'll show you my All right. Slide. I apologize for the okay. delay. Okay. Um, right. But now you'll get to see something you wouldn't otherwise see. Now, can people hear? Hello, because if you can't, then yep. I didn't hit mute. Hello, we can hear you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay, let's go to Cairo and do that quickly, because I know you're more interested in the Great Pyramids and the inside of King Tut's tomb. Uh, this is the view from my hotel room, and I will tell you another thing not to do, besides going in August, which is just when I happen to have my vacation time. I taught summer school for years, and my only break was three weeks in August, right? So worst time of the year to go to Cairo. This is on the 10th floor of a hotel, and I did something foolish without thinking about it. I said, I'm not going to drink anything. You don't drink any liquids while you're there if you don't want to become sick as a dog. Well, I didn't. I ordered bottled water or only boiled things like tea and coffee, which are safe, right? They have great coffee in Egypt. Uh, and they're former British colonies, so they make all kinds of tea. Those were safe. But one day I ate a salad in that hotel cafe and it had been washed. I'm sure that's what happened with Nile water. Guess what happened? I caught the worst infection, uh, bacterial infection I've ever had. I lost 22 pounds in three or four days. It was that bad. I actually thought I was going to die. The doctor I went to, and they have free medical care, at least when I was there, they did in Cairo. I don't know about the whole country. Uh, he said, oh, we know what that is. You poor tourists get it all the time. We call it Ramsey's Revenge. <laughs> and he gave me uh, uh, five pills uh, to take, one each day, and it knocked it out, and I was fine. So this is a view of the city I wanted to start with, actually, because this is the well-to-do neighborhood. You could tell. Look at all the trees and the overall sense of, you know, construct. You know, these buildings are well-maintained. This is the government quarter, they call it, where the employees who work for their dictatorship, because they only ever had one elected ruler, and he was overthrown by, you may know that, uh, about 2013, I think, by the current dictator. Um, so you can see, though, that even on some of these buildings, there's deferred maintenance. So let's go see what's um, around the outer edges of this neighborhood. The mysterious city of the dead. That's a mosque, the oldest and first, I think, ever built in Cairo. Cairo isn't a, a medieval, uh, sorry, it's not an ancient city. Cairo is a medieval city. It was settled by uh, the Malmuks, uh, you know, about six, seven hundred, the Arab invaders. Uh, and at that point, and that, this became an Arab culture, as you know, it's been ever since. I have people say, oh, Egyptians are Arabs. Yep, <laughs> they're the largest Arab country. Uh, anyway, that mosque where the arrow's pointing is 700 AD. It's one of the three or four oldest in the world. Why is the area below it, where I'll show you here around here, there's a graveyard or a cemetery full of tombs that have been broken into by uh, homeless people who arrive with nowhere to stay. Cairo every day gets 5,000 new people. It's probably more than that now. From the countryside with no job prospects, they just can't make a living out in the countryside or there's a drought or there's a plague of locusts or whatever that drives them into the big city. Cities, they have many big cities in Egypt, but this is the largest. Cairo has 18 to 20 million people now. Anyway, so what happens when those people don't have anywhere to go? Someone, they, they hear the rumor, oh, you can find a tomb to take over. And that's what I saw it was creepy. Walking through that graveyard, you'd see whole families inside these tombs, cooking food, hanging their laundry out. And the dead hundreds of years old skeletal bodies of the former occupants lying on the ground near them. 
<laughs> they just tossed the corpses out and took over their sarcophagi and their, you know, well, what are you going to do when you have nowhere else to stay? So that was why they called that area the city of the dead. All right. And then you can see the maintenance or lack thereof in the streets. During the British era, the city would have been probably well maintained. And yes, like so many societies, you have the uh, disparity of wealth. The soccer mom uh, said uh, has this shop to go to, but most people shop here at the street markets. Uh, and that wouldn't be a safe thing for those of us who uh, don't have resistance to Ramsey's revenge. Uh, so I didn't buy anything in those shops because I wasn't sure they were in the, or the street markets, I meant. Uh, but I did later on learn something about uh, how, how to safely conduct yourself. Because after I got sick the first time, I was able, well, I was there for three and a half weeks. It's not long enough to get a sense of the culture. The people were among the friendliest I have ever met on any trip. And there was no theft, no crime. I accidentally left one of my two cameras in a tea shop. Came back the next day, not only was it there, but the guy had it behind the counter and was you know, trying to figure out how to contact me, but I didn't leave any uh, identification. So uh, very nice. This is the Egyptian air office. And here's an example of deferred maintenance. Of course, that happens in many big cities, more so though in Cairo than many cities I've been to. And then here's an example of, well, incomplete work. <laughs> uh, this is a paint job that was being paid for by Egyptian air to some paint company and all they did was show up the first day, do that section and then leave. Years later, it still looks like that. They told me it was like 10 years ago. Noon prayer, some of you know this, in, in Muslim countries, I've been to a dozen Muslim countries. It's, it's fascinating. There are five times a day when you're supposed to stop whatever you're doing, unless you're driving a bus or operating in a hospital or something, you know, life-threatening. But if any safe opportunity is available, you stop what you're doing and kneel in the nearest you know, practical place and say your prayers. So these guys in white were walking towards uh, you know, a place to pray because I saw them do that after this picture. So this was noon prayer in one neighborhood. And then you can see the Christians in at least most of the time in the last 150 or more than that, last two or 300 years since the British colonial uh, People arrived and after their independence was one of the first countries in Africa to break, break free of colonial rule, 1954 or something, very early for Africa. Uh, but anyway, up until recently, the Christians and the uh, Muslims uh, live side by side. They worshiped. You can see that. There's a Christian church. 10% of Egypt, 10 million people are Christians. And they were Christians there before there were Muslims, of course, because the religion of Christianity is older than Islam, but they got along quite peacefully. And there's a Arabic seven and up, a seven up ad. One of my favorite details here is 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 what they had at the time. It was pirated. I'm sure by now. Well, I don't know, but I assume they have an arrangement with Disney legally. But it was illegal then. They they took pirated movies, you know, Disney cartoons and films, feature films, and showed them on Saturday. It's a Saturday afternoon matinee in a wealthier neighborhood. I can I think you can see the buildings are all well maintained. And here's uh, uh, their um, Mustafa Kemal. That's his name. Very famous in the Islamic world. He was the first independence leader. He was arrested by the British, but he was so popular they didn't dare kill him. So he was freed after the show trial. He's a hero. So there's a statue of him. And it looks like he's pointing at Donald Duck. Well, if you have ever heard Donald Duck broadcast when he does that, you know, inevitable or inimitable, I can never say that word, uh, screeching voice of his throwing a tantrum and then dub that over in Arabic, it's ear splitting, I can tell you that. So let's go now to the Great Pyramids via, well, first the Nile. Uh, it's literally a mile wide and there are boats along the Nile like these, which have been handmade uh, family heirlooms sent down from one generation to the next for 150, 200 years where the families survive by fishing on the Nile. We'll skip that, but this is, this is an optic lesson. Um, I took this photo because of the 500-year-old Turkish sentry box, which is a work of folk art, hand-carved. It was already almost 500 years old. The Turks uh, conquered Egypt, uh, oh gosh, I don't know, 1400 or so. And here we are in the late 1900s or late 20th century. So it's almost 600 years old. So here's a, a, an Egyptian soldier carrying an M16, which is a U.S. military rifle that we had sold their army, of course. 
And he just happened to see me taking the picture and he, he'd been, you know, totally ignoring me. He stepped out of the shadows, grabbed me, my camera, and tried to drag me into the army base behind there, shouting at me in Arabic. I didn't know what he was saying. I don't speak Arabic. I probably would have ended up getting in real trouble. I wasn't trying to case this place. I just wanted a picture that I, I couldn't explain that to him. I was lucky that a uh, professor of history walked up around that time and, and intervened and he spoke English and he explained what I was doing and the guard let me go. So here's the object lesson. You've heard the phrase, it is better to ask for forgiveness and permission. And eh, not when you're traveling, not when you're in a foreign culture, just the opposite is true. Always ask permission first. And I learned that lesson. I'll prove that fact, that fact in a few more slides. Here's the entrance to one of their Oh, 500 year old mosque. They're so beautiful. Look at that minaret where the prayers are given. And here's a mosque where I'd learned my lesson the next day. There's the Imam. I asked him if I could take pictures because it's such a beautiful building. It's from the 1400s, 600 year old mosque. Very few of them have stained glass windows. This one, he said, yes, if you wait till every one of my worshipers, all of us are facing away and you can't see our faces. So you see how I waited till that and then no problem. So again, keep that in mind. You always ask permission. Okay, we're going to go out to the Great Pyramids now. Ah, whoops, I went too far. So when you get to this, you might notice the camels everywhere, and I don't like riding camels. They are nasty animals. They smell, they bite, they, uh, they're noisy, and they are very aggressive. So I said, nah, thank you, but no thanks. They, you know, it was like $10 for... I don't know what an hour's ride or something. Uh, I figured I'd just head towards the entrance for the tunnel that leads to, let me see if I did. I Yeah, I think I overshot this. Yeah, there it is. Look how close the um, tour guides, quote unquote, community here, impromptu tent city uh, has come to the base of the Great Pyramid. It's even closer now. I've seen aerial shots of this. You can see this is the Great Pyramid of Geops. Okay, so now let us go up close to it. And see, when you get this close, you see why they call it a man-made mountain, literally. And then look at this. This is the entrance dug by grave robbers um, who thought they were finding, you know, the actual, or getting into find the actual artifacts. But the real entrance is off to the side here. And eventually, of course, someone found it and robbed it, picked it clean. Look how big these stones are. These are about four feet high. So it's very hard to climb. I started to climb it. I got about this high and it was 122 degrees. I said, no, thank you. I don't think I need to die of heat stroke. So let's talk about the one thing, another thing not to do. A German couple was ahead of me and my two other uh, Oaken Skyline teaching friends. The three of us were right behind them. I speak enough German to understand. I wish I'd said something to the wife before we all got into the tunnel because that tunnel is four, about four feet high. You cannot walk standing upright, maybe little kids. And it has only about every fourth light bulb that hasn't been burned out. And they're 40 watt bulbs. So you're in almost in the dark for whole sections and you're crawling on your hands and knees. So we get about halfway. It takes about 20 minutes, 15, maybe 15 to 20, seems longer, to get to the uh, the great chamber where the Pharaoh's sarcophagus is still there, but nothing else, everything else is gone, except the writing, the hieroglyphics on the wall. But it's worth going to. Anyway, so uh, halfway roughly through that tunnel, about seven minutes, into, suddenly the woman in front of me starts screaming in German, help, let me out, I have claustrophobia, I'm going crazy, I can't stand it, I'm going to die. And she started crawling backwards as fast as she could. So what could we do? We all had no choice, but everyone behind her had to crawl all that way backwards, which is not easy, till we could get her out. And she found an ambulance was waiting for her by the time. I think that the, the uh, tour guides heard her scream. So the bottom line, another object lesson, if you've got claustrophobia, don't go in a small tunnel like that. It doesn't make any sense. Now we're going to go see King Tut's tomb. This is a, a Nile riverboat. And here's the Valley of the Kings, where all of the pharaohs were buried in the late middle and all of the new kingdom until Alexander the Great conquered. Look at all that rubble from the diggings that have been done for hundreds of years. That's the entrance to Tut's tomb. That's where Lord Carter, among many things, was just a genius, was brilliant. He had to calculate, he was an engineer by training, uh, as well as an archeologist. So he, he had to figure out too much dynamite and you bury the thing, maybe forever. Um, no, no, the other way around. Too much dynamite and you could destroy it. 
you could just destroy the whole thing and you know a, a huge collapse of the hillside too little and you'll bury it in rubble and it may never be possible to dig it back into it so he had to have just the right amount of dynamite he consulted with his egyptian engineer crew the two the, together and they figured out exactly the right amount to reveal this this is the inside of the tomb and here's the proof i was talking about it's a, a painting you know obviously a fresco of tut and his wife we'll see it up close in a minute this is his sarcophagus there's anubis the jackal-headed god of the underworld who uh presided over funerals and mummification so his mask right and the mummy and the coffin were all inside this it's so huge they decided not to move it and here's what i was talking about this is him and his wife and she here he's anointing her shoulder and she is gently massaging his elbow they are truly they love birds is a word somebody used we had a tour guide who you know knew what he was talking about but he sometimes you know wanted to use corny language but the point he made was valid they really loved each other and the evidence is all over egypt you can see that from the artifacts so anyway that that's inside his tomb and us and this is in another tomb in the valley of the kings uh seti his name was one of the other fairly prominent pharaohs but not as famous or popular as tut because his tomb was found totally stripped but these frescoes are wonderful here and this is on the ceiling of seti's tomb and here we have uh the crocodile god and the hippopotamus god they had so many and then we have the skateboarding god no i didn't <laughs> that's anubis he does look like he's coming off of a ramp there but anyway so he's an odd angle and then we have the zodiac signs so Seti, I'm guessing, had some some connection to the signs of the zodiac of the bull and the lion, Leo and Taurus, right? And then here are some of the underworld minions who will guide him through the next life or into the underworld. And then we have here a couple from another tomb. Here's the queen. Uh, this is not a famous pharaoh. I don't remember his name. It wasn't Ramses. I know that. And then we can see why. Look how many kids she had. She had children popping out of her. <laughs> Uh, literally, I guess, out of her womb. And this might be the reason why, among other things. <laughs> the Egyptians were not shy about sexual uh, representations. They were not hung up about it like so many modern cultures. Okay, so let's go now to, oh yeah, this is on the ceiling above Tut, I'm back at Tut's. And you can see how the vultures are, are royal symbols, how they believe that the pharaohs could turn into themselves. Into the other. So let's end up with uh, Hetchet Soup's tomb. Yeah, that's perfect timing. There it is. You see the third level they were working on. It. That's why the other slide clearly was much older. And when they put all three together, it's very impressive. And Mussolini supposedly saw this, or at least some of his people in his uh, government. And he, he modeled all the uh, fascist buildings in Italy. I've seen them all over Italy. There's still train stations and public buildings, town halls, government buildings that look just like this. It, it, it became the model for fascism. And then Hitler did the same thing later with his architecture, and especially in Berlin. But the original idea was ancient Egyptian. Here she is. She uh, didn't have a beard, so she had her sculpture shown with a uh, fake beard. And it was a, uh, a sign of respect and also authority. As I said, the longer the beard, the wiser the person. In this case, not man, but woman. But I really like this. Here's her patron. That's her. And here's the patron gods that she had. These uh, uh, god. Let's see. What are they? I think they look like potato chips. The ears here, obviously, they're very odd ear creatures. But these are the cow gods that supposedly watched over her uh, in life and maybe after she died. And here she is dressed right with her phronic uh, headdress turned into like uh, we've been saying on there's an onk which pharaohs wore a lot of the time uh into the image of a falcon uh, which is also the the form of the god that protected pharaohs horus uh, and amun was another they had more than one god in their religion that protected pharaohs okay let's wrap it up with this slide i love this view there's the nile and for a mile or two on either side, you have fertile land. That's what feeds the whole 100 million people in Egypt. It's one of the most fast growing populations in the world. And then you just go a little ways beyond that and whoosh, desert, <laughs> nothing grows. These columns are built by Alexander the Great when he visited Egypt after he conquered it as a Greek temple. And when they were built, 
we'll leave you with this thought. How ancient Egypt is, that's what I started with tonight, how amazingly uh, you know, early their uh, urban culture uh, began. Uh, when that was built, 300 uh, BC, the ancient pyramids, the great pyramids, were already as old to the Greeks as they are to us. Uh, 2,300 years ago, Alexander the Great, another 2,300 years back before that is the beginning of the founding of unified Egypt. We started with that tonight, so it's a good point to end on. That gives you, I hope, some perspective yeah, of how long-lasting and impressive a culture the Egyptians established. Okay, any questions from anybody? If you have some others, you can, of course, always email me between now and next week. Uh, remember, your papers are due three weeks into tonight, so you should start thinking about a topic, okay, as to what, you know, uh, you might have questions I can answer for you, uh, or you can send me a sample of a draft of it, as long as you don't wait till two nights before it's due. Uh, I can give you feedback as to whether you're missing anything. Okay, well, I hope you all enjoyed not only the main slides from the syllabus, of course, you have to watch those if you want to take notes, but hopefully you enjoyed these slides as well. And occasionally we'll do that with some of the other topics like Greece and Rome. I will show you slides of ancient Greek sites and uh, Atlantis, the island of Atlantis. I have slides of it. Uh, I hope that piques your curiosity. What the heck could that be? And I'll explain when we get to uh, Minoan art, which is next week. Uh, and then when we can do Rome, I'll have several uh, sites that aren't on the syllabus of my own. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Good night. Thank you guys. Yeah. Enjoy the evening. I guess we got Thank through you. it without any glitches. Okay. Stay safe and stay out of the smoke. Okay. Let's hope the fires are gone by this time next week <laughs> for all of us. Okay.